Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 are the most scrutinized and discredited passages in the entire Bible. Genesis chapter 1 and 2, which are the account of creation of not only the universe, but of humanity in particular, are the most disbelieved and discredited passages in the Bible over the past 150 odd years. It wasn't always that way. Before Charles Darwin's publication of The Origin of the Species, there wasn't a lot of need to question Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. But after the publication and the popularization of that book and that theory, which remains a theory, not a law, after that publication, then it seemed to be the necessity of people to either do one of two things, either completely disregard those chapters as in any way reliable or anything but mythological, or two, to attempt to accommodate the Bible to Darwin's theory. In other words, all of a sudden now we've got to come up with some grand scheme in which we can marry these two ideas and make the Bible fit into Darwin's theory. So I would submit to you that the face value reading of those passages is minimally accepted in Christian circles today. Furthermore, the overwhelming majority of people and the common consensus in the culture is not that the earth and the universe were created in six days, and that humans were the special creation of God, starting with Adam and Eve, but that we all evolved or morphed from lower forms of life over who knows how many million, jillion years, and that our grandmother and grandfather were really apes. That's the common consensus in the culture today. And that consensus does a great disservice to what the Bible teaches in Genesis 1 at face value. Now, you see, the reason I say what the Bible teaches, let me emphasize the fact that there are four sources of authority historically in the church. There are four sources of authority known as the quadrilateral. There, are, there is human experience. Well, you know, I just know it happened to me. Okay, great. And they're all valid. Can't argue with what happened to you. And then there's human tradition. Well, we've always done it this way. This is the way we do it. And that's great. It's great to have tradition. And then there's human reason. In other words, well, it makes sense to me. It makes sense to me. Therefore, okay, there's validity in that. We've got a mind. God told us to love Him with our mind, didn't He? But then the fourth source of authority is Scripture, is the Bible. Is the Bible. Now you can literally analyze any group within quote-unquote Christendom by what role which or, or all of those authorities or sources of authority play in their value system. Whether it's tradition, well, tradition is great, but if tradition conflicts with the Bible, what do you do? Well, those who are traditional biblical believers would say that the Bible trumps everything. And that's who we are in this congregation and in this church. We validate all sources of authority, but anytime anything conflicts with the Bible, the Bible wins automatically. So tradition is great, but if tradition is different than what the Bible says, then tradition has to go. Human experience is great. It's great that we had that experience. But if that experience doesn't square with the Bible, then the experience is invalid. Human reason is great. 
And that's where the subject of the day comes into play. Human reason is great. But my pencil has an eraser. What about yours? There is no person that has a pencil that doesn't have an eraser except the Lord Jesus Christ. And when somebody's opinion conflicts with the Bible, then the opinion has to take second place. And what I would submit to you is simply this, that the plain, responsible interpretation of the Bible using principles that are applied from Genesis to Revelation in any passage of Scripture, as applied to Genesis 1 and 2, if you apply those principles... There is no credible way to square them with millions of years of trial and error that result in what we have now. And so my contention is not to argue with the scientists. My contention is simply to stay with the Bible and let them worry about it. Because the prophets of Israel and the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe, recorded the accurate communication and information that God wanted us to know about His truth for us. The Bible settles the issue. So why does the reliability of the Bible and the creation account, why does that matter? Well, let's look again at Genesis 1.1. Read it together with me. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. So let's break that down. First of all, in the beginning. I can never see this without thinking of that. You know where, Bible, or where baseball is in the Bible? Genesis 1-1, in the beginning. <laughs> corny, and it's so corny, but I, I cannot resist. In the beginning, just you'll remember that. But in the beginning... Based on, what's the point of reference here? The beginning of what? Well, this is the beginning. And notice God was already there. The beginning of all that is. Before anything created existed, God was already there. In the beginning, God was there. He was before the beginning. Before the beginning, God is. Now, Secondly, in the beginning, God. I mentioned earlier the Answers Bible Curriculum. Let me share a quote with you from the Teacher's Guide for this week's study. The Bible never attempts to prove but assumes the existence of God. We must avoid arguments that attempt to prove God from the natural world. Man's need to prove God implies his intention to elevate his own reason above God's Word. End of quote. The Bible starts with the assumption, the presumption, that God is. The Bible does not exist to, quote, prove God's existence in the sense that He needs to be confirmed. The Bible itself is evidence of God being who it claims He is. Understand that any attempt to fully explain God based on creation is going to fall short. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong for St. Patrick of Ireland to take a three-leaf clover and use that as an illustration of the triune personality of God, of the Trinity. I'm not saying that was wrong to do that. But I am saying to you that at some point it's inadequate. There's no analogy from creation that can fully explain God. Why? Because God is infinite. And everything else is limited or finite. You cannot fully explain the infinite with the finite. But there is something God has given us that gives us the full information we need about Him that is adequate and fully explains Him. And that's the record of the prophets of Israel and the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ inspired by the Holy Spirit, commonly known as your Bible. 
You have evidence of God, the Word of God. And the Bible can stand on its own. <laughs> the Bible has an authority all its own. The Bible doesn't need us to establish its authority. Let's look at some scriptures that confirm that. Isaiah 55, 11. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 11, it says that just as the rain and snow come down from heaven and water the earth, it says, so shall my word that goes forth from my mouth, God says, it shall accomplish the purpose for which I send it. It will not return void. The idea is this is that God's Word works in our lives. God's Word will not fail. And what, in whatever purpose, He gives it. Jesus said in John 16, 8, Jesus said the night He ate the Passover with His disciples established what we now celebrate as the Lord's Supper in conversation around the table. Jesus said that He was going to send the Holy Spirit. And He said He will convince the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. The Holy Spirit inspired the prophets and the apostles to write the Bible, and the Holy Spirit works to confirm the Bible in your heart and mind. I want to tell you that the Word of God and the Spirit of God are an unbeatable combination. That's the reason whenever I'm praying for somebody, somebody says, well, I well, have somebody want to... Uh, 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 want them to come to know Christ. I, my prayer is for them to be exposed to the Word of God and to be exposed to the people of God who confirm the Word of God and as the Spirit of God confirms His Word in their life that they might come to faith. You see, the Bible is adequate of itself. Illustrates this, Luke chapter 16. In Luke chapter 16... Jesus tells a story of a beggar named Lazarus and a rich, a wealthy man that both died. The beggar went to glory. He was with Abraham in glory. The rich man went to Hades and was in torment. And amazingly, they could communicate with each other. They could see each other, and they could talk back and forth. And so the rich man, it says, in verse 27... I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, asking to send the beggar back. For I have five brothers that they, he may testify to them, lest they come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he, that being Abraham, said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Moses and the prophets, what's he referring to? He's referring to the Old Testament in your Bible. And he says that's more convincing and more persuasive to lead someone to the truth about God, about themselves, and what they need to do about it, than even if somebody rose from the dead in their presence. How many of us have ever imagined... Well, I, you know, I just wish I was living when Jesus was on the earth and wouldn't it have been great to see... And my faith would be so strong. Have you ever thought that? Anybody ever think that? I have, right? Well, Abraham just debunks that myth. He says that the strength, the strongest thing to grow your faith is this book by His Spirit. And that's no surprise because the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. How many, how many of us here today would like to have stronger faith? I mean, I hope, surely you'll all raise your hand. I mean, you're here. Unless somebody drug you, I'm assuming that means you want a stronger faith, right? Praise God. God bless you. I'm glad you're here. I hope you're glad you're here. God's glad you're here. And your faith can be stronger because you're here. But you know what? It's not because, because of me. It's because of God's Word. You want a stronger faith? Read the book. 
Read the Bible. You want a stronger faith? Read the Bible and apply it in your life. You see, faith is simply living with confidence in what God's Word says as opposed to what any other competing influence tells us. Let me illustrate. You know, I go into a store and I see a, a brand new, one of the nicest new set of golf clubs hanging there on the shelf. And I'm, I'm going, man, wouldn't I be good if I had those clubs? And then I look at the price tag and I go, uh, no, not today. But I'd be tempted to grab them and run, right? Well, how do I know not to do that? You shall not steal. Hello, I don't have to debate that. This is not something for reason or, or rationalization. You shall not steal. <laughs> the Bible says it straight out. Walking by faith is doing what the Bible says as opposed to what any other competing influence in my life would tell me to do. That's what it means to walk by faith. And so when the Bible tells me that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and it goes on to detail how He did it in six days, evening and then morning, what's evening and morning mean to you? It doesn't mean millions of years to me, it means a 24-hour period. Evening and morning, then having said that, may not make sense to me, it's a competing idea, but I take the Bible if anything says anything different. And then Hebrews 11.3, the writer of Hebrews summarizes it best as to how God created, His Word says it, and we accept it by faith. Read it with me, Hebrews 11.3. By faith we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. By faith, that means based on our confidence in what Genesis 1 and 2 say. That's what that means, by faith. By faith, I trust God's Word because I trust the God of the Word. That it's true and His Word matters. Why does the re reliability of the Bible and the creation account matter? It matters because taking the Bible at face value is nothing you should be ashamed of. You shouldn't apologize to anybody or back up because you believe the Bible and take it at its word. We don't need to accommodate Darwin or anyone else. I remember a number of years ago I was guest speaker at a church and after church, one of the elders in the church invited me to go to lunch, just, just the two of us, to go out to lunch. And he was, uh, and, and I guess still is, <clears throat> he was a professor in the medical college at the University of Kentucky, at the medical school. And he taught doctors anatomy and physiology. In other words, he's the guy that taught doctors about the human body. So I think he knew a little bit about biology and all of that sort of thing. And he certainly had been exposed throughout his long and prestigious career to all of these ideas. And I remember when he sat there at lunch and I was amazed and gratified when he said to me, he said, there's no question in my mind that the, the universe was created in six days and that uh, Darwinian evolution doesn't stand uh, the test of hard evidence to support it. And he said, I have no problem with the Bible uh, regardless of what other evidence may purportedly be presented. Now here's a man that is among colleagues, 99% of whom believe something different, but he had absolutely no qualms and no reservation academically, intellectually, or otherwise to take the Bible at face value, and he wasn't ashamed of it. And even in his secular university setting, he wasn't ashamed of that, and we don't need to be either. And I'm not, because it's like I told him, like I told you earlier, I don't know why anybody would want to believe something that made their grandparents apes. <laughs> that doesn't say much for our identity. And then it says, in the beginning, God created. 
created. And it says He created the heavens and the earth. That's a figure of speech known as a merism, M-E-R-I-S-M, heavens and earth, and, and it, it meant the universe. For example, have you ever said, oh, they were covered head to toe? Have you ever said that, used that phrase? That's a merism. And what did you mean by that? You meant their whole body was covered. Well, this is a, a figure of speech that means that God created the universe. That in the beginning, God created the universe. You see, why does the reliability of the Bible matter? It matters because everything and everyone that exists is no accident, but the direct result of the unilateral, conscious, intentional, premeditated, proactive, specific plan and purpose of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who became flesh and dwelt among us in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Now, let me tell you why I believe this and what is meant by this. Let me break it down. Everything and everyone that exists. <clears throat> God caused everything else to exist. It's no accident. This didn't happen accidentally. You're not here by accident. This earth, this universe does not exist as a result of an accident. <laughs> But the direct result of the unilateral, what's that mean? That means God himself did it. He didn't need any help. God didn't have to have help to create the universe. He did it all on his own. Unilateral conscious. He knew what he was doing. He had full control of his faculties. Intentional. He meant to do it. It was on purpose. Premeditated. He thought about it beforehand. It wasn't a whim. He had an intention that was even beforehand, proactive. In other words, he took the initiative. God himself within himself took the initiative to create the universe. Proactive, specific. This plan and this creation uh, was planned down to the infinite detail, it seems. <laughs> Do you know the head on your hairs are numbered? That's what Jesus said. That's specific, is it not? The head on your... how many? I bet you there's not a person in this room today that knows how many hairs you've got on your head. But God knows. <laughs> the older you get, the easier it would be to count, though, wouldn't it? <laughs> Specific plan and purpose. God has a purpose. He's got a purpose for you. He's got a purpose for the creation. And even though Satan and his minions and Adam and Eve got in on the act, tried to destroy God's purpose, you couldn't cause it to fail. He came along in the person of Jesus and he straightened it out and got back on the right track. It's going to be better than even the first plan. Of the God. This is not just any God. We're not talking higher power, generic higher power here. We're talking about the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, that same God who became flesh and dwelt among us in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, our Lord Jesus Christ. That is God's creation. That's what the Bible teaches and affirms. You see... Genesis 1 and 2 explain what he did to create the universe, not how he did it. See, what, what hangs us up is we read Genesis 1 and 2 and all of a sudden we, we, we start, well, how did this happen? Listen, if he explained it, you couldn't understand it. All of us together couldn't understand it because we cannot create a thing. Now, we can shape and form and modify what's already created, but we can't make anything out of nothing. So what hangs us up, see, we understand God starts, He's here, and He created the world, and we're here, and that proves it. So just deal with it. 
And, and it's like, like, you know, it's like, you know, a small child. You, anybody ever had children? And they go, well, why? Well, why? Well, why? And you're sitting there after a while, and you go, even if I explain to you, I don't get it. So, you know, just you'll have to take my word for it. Well, that's the way it is with the created universe. Imagine us trying to understand how the universe came to existence out of nothing. That's what everybody's trying to figure out. Well, guess what? Good luck. In the end, God did it. And He's the only one that gets it. So why does the reliability of the creation account matter? Well, if God did not create the world in six days, if over millions of years there were countless predecessors to Adam who lived and died, then Adam would not be the first human. And death would have not begun with Adam as a result of sin. Why does that matter? Well, Luke 3, 37. I'm going to give you a three, few references here like we did last week and we've done earlier so that you can look them up afterward. We don't have time to look all these scriptures up, so maybe you can just review when you get home. But Luke 3, 37. The Bible says that Jesus was a direct descendant of Adam, and Adam is the first person mentioned in the genealogy in the family tree of Jesus through Mary. First person mentioned. So, first of all, Jesus is a direct descendant of Adam. Secondly, Romans 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin, death, uh, sin enter, death entered the world through sin, therefore death has spread to all people because all have sinned. Through one man, sin entered the world and death through sin, therefore death has spread to all men because all have sinned. Through one man, sin entered the world and death through sin. Sin and death came through one man. There weren't a bunch of people or predecessors before Adam that lived and died. It was through Adam that sin and death entered the world. That's what Paul said. I'll take Paul's word for it. Furthermore, 1 Corinthians 15, 45. Paul calls Jesus the last Adam. I would submit to you that you cannot have a last without a first. You cannot have a last without a first. You see, the reliability of the creation account matters because if Adam was not the first human, then it discredits Jesus' identity and his ability to rescue you from God's wrath through his death on the cross and his resurrection confirming the reliability of his sacrifice. Why does the reliability of the creation account matter? Well, let's let the psalmist in the Bible answer. We've looked at several answers, but there's one that the psalmist gives that really sums it up beautifully. Let's read this together from Psalm 100. You know the Lord is God. He created us, and we belong to Him. We are His people and the sheep in His pasture. Look at that. The Lord created us. He's God. He created us. Therefore, we belong to Him. He has rights to claim you. And in Jesus Christ, He has reconfirmed those rights and bought you back and rescued you from His own wrath. The Bible says in 1 Peter 3 that Christ suffered for sins once for all, the innocent person for the guilty, so that He could bring you to God. You belong to God. He made you, and Christ claims you for His kingdom. You see, why does it matter that Genesis 1 and 2 are true? Do you all hear something? Or is that just me? What in the world is that? Well, shoot that thing. <laughs> I just I wanted to make sure I wasn't the only one hearing that. We were. <laughs> 
Where were we? It matters. It matters that the Bible is true because you came from God. You belong to God. He made you on purpose for Himself, and Jesus can bring you safely back to Him. That's why it matters. Amen.